Francis. Okay, thank you, Lenka. And before I start, if Nati can see me, hello, Nati, and good luck in your room. <laughs> so, uh, so today we're going. Uh, I'm going to first like recap what we have seen last time, and then. Uh, present some limitations and, and move on to the new material. So what we have seen last time, the goal was to, uh, to minimize some function h, okay, in some set capital X, okay, and this was, you imagine x being like d-dimensional space which is quite, quite small and the goal is to get certificates of optimality. And we have seen like two, two views, okay, uh, two views to, uh, uh, to see this. And they were based on the assumption, okay, so the assumption was that we, can, we could express h of x as a quadratic form in some, in some feature vector phi of x. Okay, so let's take phi of x, we, we took monomials, and then this simply means h of x was a polynomial. We took like trigonometric polynomial, this means that h was a, such a polynomial. So this is what we're going to assume that we know we know uh, H, and we have seen like two views, so I'll try to write them down here. So we had seen that we could rephrase the problem as maximizing a lower bound on H to maximize C such that H minus C is positive. Okay, so this is the trivial reformulation of the optimization problem, and what we uh, discussed last time is since H can be represented as a quadratic form, it makes sense to uh, uh, represent non-negative functions as quadratic forms where the, where the matrix is PSD. And we uh, instead consider max over C such that H of X minus C is equal to phi of X transpose A phi of X where A is PSD. Okay, so this is also called like sum of squares uh, uh, relaxation. And because a set of sum of squares can be is included in the set of the negative function, we get a lower bound. Okay. So this was the uh, SOS view. But we, so this was the SOS. <coughs> but we also, uh, uh, view the dual view, which is uh, simply like taking the dual of that optimization problem and what we, it's often called the moment view. And the moment view is that to minimize h of x is equivalent to minimizing the trace of h times sigma over sigma in k and k is what the convex hull of all phi of x, phi of x transpose. Okay, so those two, this and this are equal and equal to that. Okay, this is what we, are, what we have seen. And now this is of course difficult because you don't have access to the convex hull of all of that and we consider a relaxation and like all convex relaxations typically you want to you look at your set k okay look at those and you're trying to see uh, what uh, convex constraints are satisfied by those elements the first that come to mind is for the affine constraints okay so if those uh, matrices belong to some affine subspace you better make sure that uh, your relaxation okay which we call k hat so this will be bigger than the mean over sigma in k hat of the same trace. And k hat, okay, what will it be? Okay, k hat will be at the affine hull of k. Okay, so you belong to take the affine hull of those, and for example, we have seen that for polynomials. Uh, this was like a Henkel matrix, so this what you, you, you restrict yourself to a Henkel matrices. Uh, since typically, for example, for trigonometric polynomials, the norm of phi of x was one, then the trace is one, so you, you restrict the trace is one, so you add all affine constraints that you know. 
but we know a bit more, and this is, uh, uh, but we know that this is a rank one positive matrix, so we add the PSD cone, okay? and, and that's it. Okay? And you can show, and this is what I did uh, <coughs> uh, two days ago, that essentially this is a dual of that, and this is a dual of that. Okay? So this is what we have seen, uh, what we have seen uh, last time. So I do the two approaches because some papers favor this one, some papers favor this one. They are all equivalent. Uh, anyway, so any questions on that, on the summary of last time? Yep. So in this, uh, the affine hole that you are talking yeah. about yeah. is the assumption two, right? What is the assumption two? Like the, there is exists U that we Yes, 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 yes. So, the, so yes, so indeed, so this is, uh, uh, yes, so this is to take care of the, so affine is linear constraints plus uh, uh, intercept, and the U business is to, to find the intercept, yeah. But why would, you, would we assume this was the intuition? Why, or because, uh, why? Because it's, uh, uh, you want to uh, get that the, um, you want to get that the, that the fact that the integral sums to one can be seen easily in sigma. This is so what we saw here, what we had. But did you have the integral of mu of x, h of x, and you have the integral of mu of x dx is equal to one. Okay, and we want to rephrase everything in terms of the moment matrix. Okay, the moment matrix sigma here is the integral of mu x phi of x, phi of x transpose. And what you want is that these constraints can be seen as directly on sigma. And one way of doing it, and I don't know any other way in fact, is to import that there exists a, a matrix U such that if I multiply this by U, I get U, okay, here. And this is one for all x. This is a way to make sure that the summing to one constraint can be seen as a linear constraint in sigma. This is just, just this is a very mild assumption in some sense. Yeah. Uh, you, can always, uh, you just want to say that you can represent the constant function yeah. one. Yeah. Which yeah, is yeah. Basically and if, if it's not the case, you add one to phi of x. Yes. Okay. And but most cases that I know of, what, uh, phi of x already includes one. Okay. So often phi of x is one and some stuff. Okay. So phi of x, phi of x transpose is one plus some stuff. This so what? This is also the, read, uh, the way to represent constants yeah. in our class. Yeah, yeah, and it's always the case, and typically either the first element or the diagonal, so it's just... Other questions? Yep. So for the SO2 assumption, you assume that the yeah. uh, we would consider the orthogonal complement of this band, because if uh, to, to optimize... Yeah, so, the, so here, so maybe like two days ago. So this, having this, okay, is having like two quadratic forms which are equal on phi of x. And this means that the quadratic forms, that the matrices defining the quadratic forms are equal up to the orthogonal of V. It's just like... And you would optimize over that orthogonal? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So can we say that like SOS approach is easier when the orthogonal complement is simpler and the moment uh, approach is easier when the, <laughs> the But the, the two are equivalent because projected on the orthogonal and projected on yourself is the same, what's the same? Okay. Can so be done. No, 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 one is due to each other. So if you use like interim point methods, it's formally equivalent. If you use first order techniques, typically like a primal first order technique can be transformed into a dual first order technique. So there's no, there's no major differences. It's just a matter of taste. And uh, for some problems, for example, in what I will do later for kernels, I will only do SOS because uh, uh, in SOS you work directly with H, okay, which is a bit uh, bit easier. Whereas in the in the uh, moment approach, you really need to know uh, the capital H, which may be a problem. Okay. So for polynomials, H is known, so the, the coefficient of your polynomials. But when I'm going to access my functions through function values, I will not know capital H. I will just know H of XI. Uh, I think the precise statement is if uh, this is type for all H, yes. Okay. 
because this is just the support function. So like a bit of context analysis, this is a support function, okay, minus the support function of k taken at h. And to have equality, you need the support function to be equal. So you need this to be equal for all h. This is equivalent. Okay. Any other question? No? <clears throat> right, so what are the limitations of what we have seen last time? So, uh, one, so limitations, limitations. Okay, so first, uh, H has to be of the form like that. Okay, so if you want to optimize the polynomial, it's fine, but otherwise, H is not in your, in your space, so you have to do something. And two, uh, it's not tight. It's not tight in general. And what we have seen for polynomials, okay, we have seen that for polynomials of degree R, okay, so it's okay, tight for polynomials only for, we have seen like uh, degree two polynomials in any dimension. We have seen uh, any polynomial in dimension one, and we have seen, I think, d equals two, i equals four. Okay, so those are the only cases where you get exact equivalence between the two, but anything beyond that is not true. Okay, so you won't get tightness. So what you will get is a lower bound, and sometimes I will show examples later for the combinatorial optimization is already quite interesting. But in general, you just get like a lower bound on your problem, and if your goal is to achieve like uh, the exact optimum, you need to do something else. Okay. And so, what we'll do today, I will first, so today, I will first look at what people do with polynomials, and I will define what is called the so-called hierarchies, okay, it's just to give you like, some culture on uh, what is being done, it's very active, area of research, and two, I will present like a more like a recent work from my, from my group trying to avoid those problems, okay? So we'll go with sphere of x to be infinite dimensional, okay? So that will solve that problem of being the, in, the, in that form, because that will be always true if the if sphere of x is big enough. That will solve the assumption that problem of inequality, okay? Uh, it will be equal here. Yeah? that we create extra problems because now we have to deal with infinite dimensional objects and I will this will be the topic of today. All right. Okay, can I just ask a really stupid question? I think I'm just missing. So, so K is convex by construction. Yep. So isn't the affine hull of a convex set convex? Don't you it, 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 it is convex, but it's much bigger. So what you have, so in the... <laughs> Affine, you mean like the smallest affine subspace containing your set. So if I take, for example, in 1D, if I have a segment like this, the affine hull is this. Oh, you don't, okay, 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 sorry, I understand. What? Thank you. And, uh, uh, so often in papers, you have the conic hull, the affine hull, and the convex hull, okay? And the convex hull is the intersection of conic and affine. So let's, uh, yeah, let's erase that. <clears throat> All right, so now the, how do I mean to present it? So I will follow the, uh, so first look at the simple case, trigonometric polynomials, okay, and the idea here is that I will have k strictly included in k hat, and uh, what I will add, I will add constraints to k hat to make sure that uh, k hat is get, shrinks towards, uh, get uh, shrunk towards k. So what do I mean by trigonometric polynomial? I mean, considering phi of x, being the exponential of i i omega transpose x, 
where omega is in the capital omega, the subset of Zd, and here x is minus 1, 1 to the d. So with that, I get all the periodic functions in minus 1, 1 to the d, which are two periodic. Okay. And so here, the, uh, so it's a, one example where the set x is, uh, of course, big, is continuous. Okay, so what, uh, if you apply, what is k hat here? So k hat here is simple because you just define, look at phi of x, phi of x star. And that example is the only reason why I use like complex matrices. Okay, so let's uh, enjoy it. So if you take the element omega, omega prime, then you get exponential of i pi x transpose omega minus omega prime. Okay, so what you see here is that uh, first you have that, and you have that, the norm of phi of x is always equal to 1. Okay, so this defined is essentially the set of uh, affine constraints that I was mentioning. Okay, so if I take my sigma, so the, if sigma is in the hull, the convex hull of phi of x, of x transpose, what you get here is that uh, trace of sigma, no, it's equal to the, so if you know the number of phi of x, so, um, so phi of x, again, so phi of x, omega, omega is one, okay, so this implies that the norm of phi of x squared, okay, is essentially the cardinality of omega. So it's, you have a fixed trace, but the trace of sigma is the cardinality of omega. And sigma is uh, like multidimensional tuplets. Multidim tuplets. Okay, so it depends only on the difference between omega and omega prime. Okay, so in dimension one, it's easy. In dimension two, that starts to be like a bit more complex and, and so on. So, Here? Yes. So here, I'm, I'm going to have a set of frequencies for my Fourier coefficient, but for my polynomials, and I'm, going, I'm assuming that I take a finite subset of coefficients, capital omega, and all of them are uh, integer valued. So essentially, those are the Fourier when I take h of x of that form, capital H will be the set of the Fourier series, the Fourier series of uh, small h. It's just a way to it's so one way, very complex way of writing the Fourier series of H. Okay. Any uh, phi x omega omega is a square missing? What, 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 what? There is a square missing. Ah, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thanks. Okay, omega. Okay. But it's just like writing this with omega could come over. So this is like my affine hull, okay? And uh, what I showed, what I didn't show, I, ex I stated on, on Wednesday was that the, when d is 1, this is tight, okay, when, if I take omega big interval minus r to the r, but if you go multidimensional, it's not tight anymore, okay, so there are uh, the strict, uh, strict inclusion, but one, one way uh, to, uh, to make it uh, stricter is to, in fact, embed, so you embed omega, in a bigger set, let's call that uh, theta r, which is a set of all omega, so that omega, let's say, infinity is less than r, okay? So you're going to embed your set of frequencies which you need to represent h. So typically, the choice of omega is dictated by the, uh, the function you want to optimize. So if function you want to optimize at the finite Fourier series, you take omega as being essentially like what you need to represent h, but to make it uh, tighter, you add more frequencies. Okay, essentially all the whole hypercube, uh, but in the intersection of the hypercube and the set of, uh, of uh, integers. And essentially, uh, you, this creates then a big CR of x. Okay, and the way to see it,
Ah, no, I will be like, uh, not bigger than that, uh, smaller than that, because this is a set of, you consider this with omega in ZD. Okay, so you take, uh, usually in 2D, you take like, this is R, you take all the omegas which are uh, integers, like that, okay? So you have many of them, okay? So the cardinality of, of theta R will be R to the D, but 2R to the D. So the way to see that, that CR of X... Ah, okay, you, you basically, R is the maximum... Uh, maximum, ma it's the maximum value of any frequency. Okay. So you, the way to see that CR of X will be phi of X times some other stuff, okay? Because uh, in the frequency that I have in theta R, I have the one in omega, okay? So this means that when I write C of X, C of X transpose, uh, you get phi of x, phi of x star, plus some other stuff which I won't write, okay? And so this means that, so now I'm going to consider the k hat, the covenant of k hat for psi, okay? And, uh, and I will take that my sigma will be the projection of that bigger k hat onto the first, like the first uh, component, okay? So this includes so the alpha and hull will be, will be if once you restrict, the alpha and hull is the same. But when you take PSDness, okay, so if this big metric is PSD, this implies that that block is PSD, but the converse is not true, okay? If that block is PSD, it doesn't mean there exist other blocks within the alpha and hull that will be PSD. Okay, so this is like, uh, uh, and, um, and what you can show is that if you let R go to infinity, then uh, k hat will converge to k, or k, k hat ha will converge to k, but the projection of k hat ha onto the first bar will converge to k, and the SOS relaxation gets tighter and tighter. Okay? So essentially, you make the set bigger by having more and more frequencies. Of course, the cardinality of omega will be here 2r plus 1 power d. Okay, so when uh, R of, theta, of theta R, sorry, sorry, of theta R. So to get tighter and tighter, you have to consider a psi, which is bigger and bigger. So when you run the algorithm, okay, you have to deal with matrices of size, the size of psi, so it gets like larger and larger. Okay, and the hope is that you stop when R is uh, not too large. Okay, so this is, uh, this is uh, the way uh, you will uh, constrain, you will do like things which are tighter and tighter. Okay, so in practice, you start with R small, and typically you, as soon as you increase R, you get a higher value of the lower bound. You construct your estimate from above, and once they match, you stop. Okay, and so here, the, what is at stake is uh, either you hope that you will stop with R small, or you prove that you can stop with R small. Okay, so this is... a uh, so this is uh, more difficult, and at the moment there are no, uh, I think the bound that people have are not, not great at the moment. Okay. Yep. Maybe an question, why don't you start with theta r? What's the, why introduce omega? Because you need, you need omega will be the one that you need to represent your function. Okay. So typically you would take theta r with r big enough to represent h, and that's it. CR will be the, the corresponding uh, uh, moment, corresponding feature for that big set. Okay, so all those exponential, but for omega, not in the omega that you start with, but with the, the, the cube. Okay. So then you always take a cube, okay? You make sure the cube is big enough to include your function, okay. and you increase the size of the cube until you're satisfied. Yeah, it's always a relaxation, it's always a lower bound, okay? But because you optimize over sets which are smaller and smaller, the k-sets are smaller and smaller, the lower bound will always increase. And what you can show is that it will increase always towards the op global optimum. So this is the, the problem. Yep. Is, is there some intuition that if it was a ZR that would be smaller than uh, if you were working modulo R, uh, then you would have the, uh, then uh, 
totally it would, uh, it would have, uh, these things would have been simultaneously diagonalizable, so this would be would have been tight, and if R is big enough, then that's a, 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 I think I I believe that a proof technique to show tightness could follow that direction. So you so you uh, you take so you restrict x now to be uh, at the uh, a grid. Then your phi becomes uh, circular, so everything is easier, and probably the yeah that to me that that that, that would be uh, I'm not sure, but this is this is to be looked at, and I know that people have been trying to prove to prove like uh, tightness or bounds, but it, I see this as being a good candidate for proving tightness, but I didn't check. Okay. Right, so this is not what I'm going to do. Okay, so this is the uh, 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 the simple version of hierarchies where uh, essentially you just embed your problem in a bigger problem. Now let's do polynomials because it's it's uh, we oh let's do the boolean thing because it's simple. Okay, and use the lot. All right, so the. So let's take x being minus 1, 1 to the d. Okay, and start simple for the moment, phi of x being just 1 and x. Okay, so this means that if, you, if this will work for function h, which are essentially, this is like we saw yesterday for, the, uh, for rd, you get uh, essentially quadratic function, an xt transpose uh, Ax plus bt transpose x plus, okay, so this is what I wrote last time. So essentially here, I want to minimize quadratic functions on the hypercube. Okay, so this is a well, very classical problem. And this is one instance of this framework with the Boolean hypercube and the simplest possible non-trivial uh, uh, phi. Okay. So now, what is the case or the way typically you would derive relaxation for that one? You will write this as the trace, well, trace of 1x, 1x transpose c b, the one half, b b transpose b a, okay, and then you need to find add relaxations uh, of that, okay, and typically to do that, you know that uh, uh, one if you take, let's say uh, sigma being 1x, 1x transpose. You know that sigma is PSD. You know that the other of sigma is uh, is one, okay? Because uh, xs transpose x is minus one one, okay? So xs transpose the element ij is xi xj, and on the diagonal it's xi square, so it's always one, and. Uh, uh, yeah, so you have other constraints I want to forget for the moment, but uh, this is uh, the way you would write the relaxation. And essentially, when you apply this to max cut, so for max cut, there is no, for max cut, and there is no like linear term, it's a bit easier. Then uh, what we end up with, so for max cut, let's do max cut, so it would be easier for max cut. So for max cut, you get essentially. The h of x is one half of x transpose a x. So this is one half of trace of a x x transpose. And this one you relax to uh, being PSD and diag is equal to one. Okay. So this is a max cut relaxation. So SDP relaxation of max cut. Okay. And this happens to be the first layer of the hierarchy because you just take phi of x equals x and you're fine. So here, what is nice about that is that, uh, uh, so statement one, it's not tight. Okay, so it's not tight, but, and Boaz is the expert here, it does not really matter so much if you can get something close enough. Okay, can you get bound between the SDP relaxation and the optimal value? And it turns out that there are bounds, okay? There are bounds, 
So essentially, if you take, let's call it capital X, if you take a solution of the SDP, so if you take X star equals to half min of trace of X, so that X is PSD and the of X is 1, Right. Then there is a nice, a very simple way, by, so this is like the idea of Gummons and Williamson uh, from 95, to come up with a candidate X with, with known uh, guarantees. So let me just briefly mention them because it's interesting. So what you can show, so you take X equal to the sign of something which is normal with mean zero and covariance matrix X. Okay, so you sample, you sample uh, a normal uh, distribution with mean zero and covariance matrix X. So since X is PSD, it's a well-defined covariance matrix. You take the sine vector, minus one or one, depending on your positive or negative component-wise. And then uh, what you can show, you can show that the expected value of X, AX, is uh, well-behaved. Okay, so that if you take your objective, uh, objective value, H, you know that it's upper bounded, uh, uh, it's lower bounded by the SDP relaxation, but this one is also not too far from, from the global optimum. Okay, so I will, now we'll need to put like, assumptions on A, is it like pointwise positive or not, or PSD, and you get constant factor approximation, and if you want to know more, this will be in the notes that will be like, available. Okay, so just to highlight the fact that getting the exact result is not really what matters, at least for that type of problem. And I'm sure Boaz has a long sequence of papers showing that if you increase the hierarchy a bit, you get tighter bounds uh, or not. Not for Max Kadachi, that no. would be... It's, it's really optimal, the... Uh, yeah, I mean, that would resolve the unique games conjecture, which is, is not known. So. Yeah, you have not done it yet? No. <laughs> yeah, so by the way, so for all of those, like, combinatorial problems, uh, Boaz has a very nice uh, website where everything is well, well laid out, and I'm not going to mention it too much, but this is like there's a whole area uh, of, about discrete problems where the goal is not to be exact, but to be able to take the result of the SDP, round it in some way, typically a randomized way, and proving that in expectation it does, it does well. Okay? So this is the uh, classical, so this is like, this is the idea of Goumans, and not Gumans, okay, it's Gumans and Williamson, okay, from 95. Right, so this is the first level of the hierarchy, okay, and now how, how do I get, how do I get to, uh, how do I get, how do I embed my problem in the bigger problem? By very much like the uh, trigonometric polynomials, I'm going to add elements here, okay? So the way to define the hierarchy, So the way to define the hierarchy, so uh, the hierarchy. So you're going to use essentially like uh, the Fourier transform of the hypercube. So what is the Fourier transform of the hypercube? So you define for every if A is a subset of uh, one to D, you define phi A of X as a product from I in A of Xi, okay? So this is always in minus one, one. If X is in minus one, one, you take products of minus one, one, so it remains in minus one, one. And this is really the Fourier transform on the hypercube, okay? And uh, so the way, and essentially, what we have done here is take A being the empty set and all the singletons, okay? And the way to make it tighter is to add more subsets Okay, so you add very much like before. I'm going to, to, to take all the A's with cardinality less than R. Okay, and uh, when R is 1, I get back the Gummons Williamson thing. When, when R gets bigger, I get uh, more moments. Okay, and of course, the cardinality of the set of A's which satisfying this, of course, grows uh, quite fast with R. And so what is tight here, if I increase R, okay, then I embed my phi of X in a bigger phi of X, 
Okay, I get a bigger SDP. And if R is big enough, then I get a, a, a tightness. The difference here is that R can be finite. You can prove finite convergence. R is n is obvious, obviously true, but you can go, you can go a bit lower. Okay. So the whole area of SOS for commercial optimization is essentially uh, uh, doing this with uh, Fourier tr uh, Boolean Fourier transform of higher degree. Okay. And similarly, you can derive that you have a topless tab structure on those coefficients. Okay. So there's a lot of structure uh, here, but I refer you to the nice uh, uh, website of Boaz for that. Okay. Any questions on the uh, hypercube? No. So this was the easy case. Now let's I will go briefly over the the painful case, which is polynomials. Okay, and the idea being that uh, we don't want to do that. Okay. All right. So so for polynomials, okay, I will go the other way. I will look at the uh, SOS version. Okay, and I will simply mention one result, which is the. Putina, so it's a bit so positive. Okay, I'm not good in German. But positive Stellen. That's okay. I think this is from 1993. Okay, so what we have seen is that if I, I have a non-negative polynomial, it may not be a sum of squares. Okay, but can you can you still say something? And what you can say? So it's going to be tiny bit like more for more. So I'm going to, to, to design to assume that I have a set K, which is defined as a set of X so that for all J from 1 to M, G, J of X is positive. And all of those would be polynomials. And I would be in RD. Okay? So I have a set defined by a polynomial inequalities, okay, fine, and what I want is uh, conditions, so what I want to, sh to, to have is that F is strictly positive on K, implies hopefully that F is a sum of squares, okay, that will not be true, what will be true is that F can be written as F0 plus a sum from J equals 1 to M of Fj gj, where those are SOS this time, okay? So let's first check that it's not really stupid, that if f can be, can be represented like this, do I get positive f? Yes, because if I take uh, an element uh, of x in k, this is positive, this is positive, the sum is positive, this is positive, this is positive. Okay, so at least it's not like totally out uh, of the, it's not totally stupid. And it it totally non-trivial, uh, the fact that any f which is strictly positive on k happens to be uh, uh, something like that. So you can represent f through a sum of squares, but not one, but one plus others, okay? And uh, so this is a nice fact, but two problems. Okay. You need technical conditions on K. Okay. Which is not too, not too difficult. You need at least one of those cells to be compact. Okay, so that's, that's okay. But degrees are unknown. Okay, the degrees of the F0 and GJ are unknown. So they maybe have, you may have some consolations between the coefficients. So this means that you know that there exist polynomials F0, FJ, but they can be of arbitrary degree. So where the hierarchy comes from is by increasing the degree of the allowed uh, polynomials for F0 and FJ. Okay, so at the end, you're going to represent non-negative functions through like those like M plus 1 SOS polynomials. Okay, so this is you can do this in polynomial time, the ways we have described last time, okay? And then you increase the degrees, okay? And this is what, 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 it, what, what the hierarchy is doing. You can, you can have the moment view, but that's kind of painful, so I won't do it. 
just to give you a highlight of what is done in this, in this, in this uh, area. So if you take any papers on SOS polynomials, you first have like five pages explaining all that, pretty much. Okay, and typically that's uh, tough five pages. Okay, and the goal is to be simpler. Okay, today. All right. No, FJ, uh, oh yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, so no, 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 so maybe I should change, let's call it H. So H is a polynomial, okay, and I'm, uh, so you should, this is true for all X, so H of X is F0 of X plus all of this uh, depending on X. This is a polynomial, real valued, this is a real valued polynomial. All, all my functions are real valued uh, here. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I, I, it's been a while since I looked at it, but uh, don't you maybe sometimes need also coefficients that corresponds to product of the DJs? Or no, no, so this is the other uh, positive challenges from a person I, I forgot, yes. where you have less assumptions, but you need, you need to take all products of DJs, okay? But this, this gives a hierarchy, not with M elements, but two to the M elements, that's even worse. But it's a bit tighter. It's a bit tighter. The result will be stronger, but you need like uh, more coefficients. All right. So this was the uh, just the background. Now let's move on to the uh, kernel world where things will be easier, hopefully. All right. So the idea will be simple. So I will start with my same problem: sup over c of C such that H of X is C plus phi of X transpose A phi of X. From now on, I'm going to take real valued. That would be easier. Okay, let's not make our life too difficult. All right, and the idea we go will be to take phi of X uh, uh, infinite dimensional. So for this, I will, need, uh, I will need kernel methods. So we know about kernel methods, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Okay, so I'll get okay, some of you. Okay, so I'll be, do a small review what we need. All right, so a bit like a five minute review on kernel methods. All right, so now we're going to consider some phi from x. So here, x will be anything. Okay, this is the beauty of column method. You can define them on anything. And now you don't map it to c power d or rd. You map it to a Hilbert space of your choice. Okay. And the idea is to consider linear functions. Linear functions. Of course, linear in quotes. I mean like linear in uh, the feature vector x f phi of x, okay? So from now on, yeah, from now on, I'm going to consider this with a dot product for the, for the Hilbert space, yeah? Sorry, so the statement that you presented before, yeah. is that a theorem or just a, a... Oh, that's a theorem by uh, Putina. It's a theorem, okay. Yeah, and so there are, there are some technical conditions, mm -hmm. okay, to make it true, but if one of the DJ leads to a compact set, okay, so if you take one of the, if, Often you, you take uh, g1 of x to be r square minus x square, and this being positive makes it compact, and you're fine. Okay, so this is, this is a. Yeah. Is the problem statement on the right board? Do we want a psd? Yes. Thanks. A psd. Okay. All right. So linear function. So the, the goal of all those like kernel method business is to look. At function, which can be linear in very high, uh, on a very high dimensional uh, feature, and the key property, okay, because the representer theorem, in that if you minimize, okay, if you minimize, if you want to minimize a function on on with some, on some, where the function here is evaluated as some x1, x2, xn. Okay. 
plus the norm of f, okay, so this is the norm in the Hilbert space, then it's a problem in an infinite dimensional feature space, uh, vector space, f belongs to Hilbert space, but you can take f as being sum from i from 1 to n of alpha i phi of xi. Okay, when so alpha, so you start with a problem which is over f in capital F, okay, so this is like very big space, but at the end you just, look, you just need to look at alpha in Rn, okay? And this is an old theorem, I think, by Waba and Kimmeldorf in 1971 or 0, I forgot, okay? So this is the whole area, this is where the, what started the, the intensive use of those uh, uh, of kernel methods in the all areas where you need to look at functional values. And statistics and machine learning are places where you look at functional values, so this is why it's so, it's so important. All right, and even better, now you can... Well, I write it again. Now you can... You can write the function, so x equals f transpose phi of x is then equal to sum over i from 1 to n, alpha i, and you get phi of x dot product phi of i. Okay, and you call that k of x, x i, and this is a kernel function. <coughs> and the key uh, in kernel method is that uh, There are many Hilbert spaces from which phi of x you don't really know, but k you can compute. And I will show example in a moment. Okay. So essentially we're going to go, we, 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 we will not consider phi of x directly, we will consider uh, k, okay, and there is, the reason we can do that is that from a classical result from Aaron, Aaron Jean, I don't know how you spell it, saying that If k is positive definite, so let me write it on positive definite. And what is positive definite? It means that if you take any, if you take any uh, data and compute the pairwise kernel matrix, so the matrix composed of all pairwise kernel evaluations, this matrix is PSD. Okay, this is what it means to be PSD. Then There exists phi that goes from x to some Hilbert space f such that k of x y is phi of x phi of y. Okay. This, is, this one is not a trivial. Although representative theorem is like two lines, it's just like a Pythagore, Pythagore uh, theorem. Okay, this one is more involved. Okay, I give you, I give you a function k which is pretty definite. Then I know they exist, in fact it's unique, up to isomorphism, Hilbert space, and, uh, and uh, phi, so that the kernel is of that form. Okay, so we're going to use kernels for computations and use phi of x to see, to, to be uh, in, a, in a Hilbert space. So examples, and then we can move on. So examples. So all sub-OLF spaces, to by space, of order s bigger than d over 2 on Rd. Okay, so here was, what is very important is that, so essentially what, uh, what it means is that if you, if you have a function here, you have a function f of x, the function that depends on x, and we, we want that the Dirac's are linear forms, okay? So the Dirac to be linear form you have to be uh, small enough. So L2 does not satisfy that. The Dirac's are not in L2. But if functions are smooth enough, the Dirac evaluation at the point will be in the space. And uh, in terms of derivatives, so you need to have all the derivatives up to order S, which are in L2. So this is like uh, all derivatives of order less than S are in L2. Okay, and so you need like to be very differentiable, okay, and 
the order of differentiability grows with dimension. Okay? So we get a space of very smooth functions. Okay? So the, if, you be, if you use a kernel space, or reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which is the same thing, it's always with smooth functions. Okay? Well, an example for that, then you can derive that k of xi, for example, is exponential of x minus y2 for s being d over 2 plus 1 half. Okay, so this is the classical example. So it's not the Gaussian kernel. There is no square there. Okay, the Gaussian kernel corresponds to functions which are infinitely differentiable. It's, uh, uh, it's called the Abel, Abel kernel, or sometimes Laplace. Okay, and this is uh, uh, the way to represent functions which are just like slightly above the threshold. All right, so I'm going to use, uh, uh, from all the development for the SOS uh, relaxations, that kernel and the associated phi of x there. Okay. So we, we will work with phi of x, but in fact, it will be never actually computed. Okay. Any questions on this like, quick review of kernel methods? Oh, let me check if I have not forgotten something. All right, so now let's move on to the uh, relaxation. So we call that Casos with KSOS. And the Casos are Alessandro Rudi, Ulysse Marteau Ferret, and myself. Okay. All right, and there is like okay, a bunch of paper in 2021, 22. Okay. So, and in the notes, I will like, there will be the precise references. All right, so what the simple idea is that we're going to take the sup over C and A PSD of C such that uh, for all X, in omega, and I will define what is omega. H of x is c minus phi of x, phi of x, a phi of x. All right, so what, what is important here? All right, so omega will be a simple set. Think of minus 1, 1 to the d. Okay, we need to rest it to a compact okay, to make everything easier. So anything simple on which you can sample from. Okay, something like that. A, what is A? Is an operator from F to F. Okay, so F is a feature space associated with my kernel. Okay, and A used to be a matrix before, but now it's a self-adjoint operator, so it's self a joint op operator, which will be a uh, positive definite, okay? And then, yeah, so this is uh, the problem, okay? So the many questions need to be answered now, and I will answer them one by one. One is feasibility. So what do I need for this problem to make sense? Okay, so I need to make sure that there exists at least one A PSD so that H satisfies that. Okay, we have seen before for the polynomial case, H had to be a polynomial. What is a feasible set here? Two, is it, and the answer will be, it will be feasible if H is smooth enough. Two, tightness. Do I need, do I get tightness? Do I need to add extra uh, constraints? And uh, second, compu computations. Because here I have, uh, I have made that problem harder because now I have A which is infinite dimensional, okay? And I've not removed the dense set of constraints, okay? So now my problem is, it's, it's, it seems harder, but we will see that this will be like good and this will be like uh, taken care of using like the kernel trick.
All right, so first feasibility, that would be easy. So essentially, uh, uh, what we need is that uh, uh, H is uh, uh, smooth enough to be represented by phi. Okay, so we're going to assume that the assumption will be that H is is Cm, okay, so m times continuously differentiable, and with m strictly bigger than s. That correct? Yeah, it should be that. Okay, so this means that you can represent a, you can h in such a way. Okay, so this would be like I don't want to spend too much time on that. I want to spend time on tightness. Okay, so let me check. So what do we mean tightness is, so can I represent a non-negative function as the sum of squares? Okay, so this is the, the key question. If I give you g positive, does it imply that g is a sum of squares? So this is a question that we have to answer. And compared to what we had before, now we are not making assumptions like about like g is a polynomial of given the given degree and the square the components of the square are polynomials. I'm just looking at continuous function. So I'm going to take g being cm, and I want so g to be a sum over i. So we have a family of h i square. And you want hi to be c m prime, okay? And hopefully the m prime as big as you want, okay? So this is a this is a goal. I want to decompose as a sum of square because if this is the case, okay, then I can represent each of those in my kernel space, and I, I will get feasibility, okay? So this is a question that needs to be answered, answered to check feasibility. That can I represent this with a sum of squares of sufficiently regular functions? Okay, so let's look at the dumb, like quick, quick response. So what is a quick response? Do you know a simple way to represent a, a positive function as a square or a sum of squares with a single square? Yes. Okay. The quick response is g is square root of g square. So for polynomials, it's not allowed. Here it is allowed, but is it a sufficient answer? Yeah. Yes, the problem is uh, differentiability. So if g is strictly positive, okay, everywhere, that's fine. Because the square root is infinity on the strictly positive numbers, you're fine. But as soon as g touches zero, okay, this will be a difficulty. So you have a function positive, Okay, positive, okay, that is touching zero. And as soon as it is touching zero, then the square root trick will not work. Example, you start with x squared, which is uh, c infinity, and you get back to x, which is just like uh, c zero, okay? So you cannot do that, okay? So you have to do uh, something else. And let me highlight the trick that we have found with uh, Alessandro and Rudy, uh, Alessandro and uh, Ulysse. Let me write it. I'll write it again, that's fine. So the trick is simple. So I'm going to make some proposition. Okay, so if, uh, if G is positive on, on a, Let's say uh, on the compact, okay, on omega, whatever, and uh, uh, g mean over g is attained at uh, uh, at x star in the interior of omega. So essentially, I must want to the, the minimum is in the middle, okay, and G is CM, then uh, uh, 
there exists a sum of square representation with uh, m prime being m minus 2 and d plus 1 function. This is essentially uh, what we will be able to. to what is it again, like the second line means? So the minimizer, okay, min, min, minimizer of G. So, for the, is it, is it, you assume it has only one minimizer? Yeah, for simplicity, but you can have, you can extend this to any potential, uh, any potential set of minimizer, okay? You can have like a manifold, you can have like anything. For simplicity, have a unique minimizer, okay, attain the middle. Okay, so if you want to look at the more general statement, it's going to be a bit more complex. Okay, and what we can show is that we're going to lose in the sum of square representation, we're going to lose differentiability a bit. We lose two orders, okay? Uh, but the gain is that we, we have like a finite number of functions. Okay, so this is uh, important uh, for later. So the proof, so the proof, uh, we only do like the, the simple arguments, okay, but the proof is simply a, a, a Taylor with in, a integral remainder, okay, so how it works, so what is, if phi goes from 0, 1 to R, you know that phi 1 is phi of 0 plus phi prime of 0 plus the integral from 0 to 1 on 1 minus t, phi second of t dt. This is the uh, Taylor, uh, Taylor expansion with integral remainder at order 2. You apply it to phi of u, or phi t, being, uh, okay, so here, to simplify my life, I will take this equal to 0, and g of x star equal to 0. Okay, so I'm going to have a sum of square between myself and the minimum, okay? So I'm going to take phi t being uh, g of t times x. Okay, and then what, I, what do I get? I get the Taylor series with integral remainder in Rd, okay, which is g of x with b g of 0 plus x transpose the gradient of g at 0 plus the integral from 0 to 1, 1 minus t, x transpose the Hessian of g at tx times x dt, okay? The idea that phi prime of t here is x transpose gradient of g at tx, and the, and the derivative of the 2 is x transpose the Hessian of g at tx at x, okay? So this is just like taking derivatives of phi, which is, which is expressed with gradients and Hessians of g, and just rewriting this like this, okay? Did I make a mistake? No. No, looks good. All right, so now, uh, uh, so essentially this is like the second order expansion, which is exact because of the integral over there. All right, so now I can use my assumptions. This is zero. This is zero. This is zero, and why is this zero? Because my minimizer is in the interior, okay? So it has zero gradient. If it was in the boundary, gradient would not be zero. So gradient is zero. And now what I have here, I have something that starts to look good. So it starts to look good. Why? Because what I have here I have an integral, this is positive, this is like, you start to have some sum of squares, okay? And the key here is that we know we're going to add one condition, okay? Condition, Oop. otherwise it's not true. And the gradient, the Hessian of G of X star is invertible. Okay, so this is a this is a stronger assumption. Essentially, the minimizer is a second order strict. Okay. And this means, so of course, the Hessian at the optimizer is always PSD. Okay, it's a, it's a minimizer, it's a local minimum, but it's strictly invertible. So this means that 
the gradient of the Hessian of G at zero is bigger than lambda density. So this means that for x small enough, then the gradient, the Hessian of G at Tx has is our body with the gun values, lambda over 2. Yes, we have your possibility just because I don't want to write this with uh, X star everywhere. Okay? And so locally, this is PSD. Okay? And the beauty is it's strictly PSD. Okay? It's, uh, it's definite, definite. And the beauty is that now I can play the square root trick. Okay? Not in R, but in RD. So one fact is that the uh, positive square root function is infinity on on a, a strictly on positive matrices positive symmetric matrices okay. non trivial fact but you have to believe me on that and in the note there will be a reference of a paper showing that but it's very much the extension of the classical square root. Okay. All right, so what it means is I, I can write, I can write this as a square of its square root. Okay, so now I can write this as g t of x, one half times d g t of x, one half. Okay, I'm allowed to, to say that. And this, uh, uh, this term will be of, of order m minus 2. Why? Because g is, of, is a cm, the relation is cm minus 2, and I take a, a sin infinity function, I get m minus 2. So this is uh, of uh, order c uh, m minus 2, and now it's done because I can write this as zero get the so I'm going to be uh, smart the sum from i equals one to d of the integral from zero to one of one minus t of essentially a gradient two g tx one half time x component i square dt Right, so I'm just like look at the components of the of the I take that I take the product with x, okay, and I just like uh, expand the square norm uh, through these so the components, and now I have my and this is h i of x square, okay, because it's a uh, wait 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 wait. Why is it a square? Okay, I'm missing something. No, you take... No, 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 you do it afterwards, okay? So you have to... Sorry, sorry. You have to enter this inside, okay? So let me do it again. So you first have to enter the x outside, okay? So you, you do... This is x transpose integral of 0 to 1 of x transpose... Gradient, no, it won't work. Okay, so I, I applied some. Oh no no no! I have it. I have it. I have it. I have it. G T of x, x. Okay, d t. Now I'm going to take the square root of that guy. Yes. Okay. This is what notes are important. Okay. And and so this is, uh, uh, no of. That guy, let me do it. Yes. I have it. All right, so I start from that, and I simply extra the x. I get something like that. Now, since for all tx I'm positive, that thing will be, you can check, will be uh, lower bounded by lambda over 4. It's bigger than lambda. You take the integral, you get one extra lambda, lambda over 2. You get an extra factor of uh, 1 over 2. I'm missing, not yet, not yet. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, so it's, so it's square square. Yeah, sorry. And now, so now I can write this as, uh, uh, let's call that R of X. Okay, and now I write it as some R I of R of X one half X I square. Okay. All right, so this is the correct one. Sorry. All right, so now I have a sum of squares uh, uh, explicitly. And again, this R function is uh, Cm minus 2 because G is Cm, and taking the square root doesn't uh, uh, degrade my problem. So now this shows that locally, if x is small enough, uh, g is the sum of squares around its uh, minimum, minimizer. And now I, will, I need just to, to take care of what's happening far away from the optimum. So the idea is that this is g, this is x star. I know that here, here I'm fine, I'm a sum square. But there, I'm fine as well because g is strictly positive. So I can apply the square root trick. Okay, and now I need one square root for that part, the d function for that part, and I can cut things together with like partitions of unities, and I want to do uh, to do this, but it's just to highlight the fact that uh, we lose uh, one order of differentiability, and uh, uh, we don't know how to avoid that at the moment. Why? Because the, uh, the sum of the, the square components here depends on the Hessian of G. So if G was CM, you lose two, order, you lose, you lose two orders. So that's what it's written, right? M is equal to M minus 2. M prime, M prime, the order of the components is M minus 2. You lose a bit, but not as much as, a square, as doing a full square root. Yeah. No, here at the moment there is no archaeology. It's just it's just a statement about function, continuous uh, functions in uh, in R D. Okay, but the immediate consequence is that now if I take a function g, so let's look at the consequence. So the goal is to look at the consequence. Uh, the consequence there. And uh, b plus one, the, the one is the square root of the positive part, right? Yes, the square root of the positive part. You have to stuck them together, you have to glue them, but it's classical in uh, analysis to glue things together like that. And corollary, so if, uh, so for my problem, initial problem, so if H has a unique minimizer, at x star in the interior of my set and the Hessian of h as x star is psd and h is cm where m bigger than s plus 3 we need then there exists a psd such that uh, h of x minus inf of h is equal to a sum of square. Okay, and of course, a is bounded, okay? And there is a a which is like a, a true a, not something which is infinite. Okay, so it's just a corollary, why? Because if I take, so I'm going to uh, not do the exact, to the totally uh, formal proof, but you start with H is CM, you apply the lemma over the, by the proposition over there, you get the functions HI square here, each HI is C M minus 2, can be represented in my RKHS, okay, so I take the RKHS representant, this gives me a rank 1 matrix for each of the representant, and A will be the sum of those rank 1 matrices, and I get my A. Okay. And the key here is that you need you really need, you really need the number of functions to be finite, okay, to make sure that the the operator A has everything finite, okay, in terms of uh, after, in terms of spectral norms. Okay. And this shows tightness, 
Okay, so if you remember what, what the goal was, the goal was to show that uh, uh, the relaxation was tight, and how it is tight because we know that there is an S star that will achieve the global optimum. Okay, so in fact we call it S star. Yeah. The no, no, a star, a star is anything, no, a star. H x star has an H x star. No, so we. Uh, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I, um, the only issue is that in France, posi uh, okay. I'm, I'm getting mixed up with positive and negative, okay? So it's invertible. Okay, so I get. Getting lost with the uh, double negations and anyway, yes, uh, invertible. Yeah. So this is, of course, this is a, a strong assumption. Okay. So this, if you have like weird minima with like Hessians being like uh, degenerate, it won't be true. But if you you are not satisfied with a unique minimizer and you want something more complete, they have a recent paper with uh, Ulysse and uh, Ali doing the whole thing with manifolds and, and so on. Okay, so this, we try to be as general as possible, but the idea is always the same. You just do the same trick, okay, using like uh, Taylor expansions. But if you have manifold, you have to do this on the manifold, that's, and that's a bit like uh, technical, let's say. All right, so now we have front tightness. Okay, I had three questions, which was feasibility, let's say I, easy, no, it's tight. Now I have to solve it. So how do I solve it? Solid. Yeah. Yeah. It's omega. Yeah. Why? Why do I need it? It does because if I want to get like a finite expansion of the sum of squares, it's easier in the compact space. Okay. If I'm non-compact, then the expansion is infinite, but locally finite. It starts to be like over technical, but it's really to to make sure that everything remains. And in any way, when you optimize, you can always like add functions that will make you go in a compact set. Okay. And, uh, yeah. When we, when we don't have compactness, then the Hessian, uh, the Lipschitz constant of the Hessian might also not be bounded, right? So this small enough might be like we, it might not be a constant. Right? You mean for that argument? Yeah. yeah. No, I think lo locally it's fine. It's locally it's fine. It's simply that. Uh, uh, you have to take care of what's happened at, at, at infinity. Okay, so it may be the case that your function is something like that. Okay, and this is not fun. Okay, so, <laughs> so, yeah, but not fun. It's interesting, fun for some people in some days, but not today. <laughs> All right, so now let's look at our problem. Okay, sup, C, C, such that. H of x is C plus phi of x transpose A phi of x. Okay, so I've solved one problem of the classical hierarchies. I don't need hierarchies because this, this will be tight. Okay, but I get, I still have two problems. I have this for all x in omega. And I have A being a, not, not anymore a matrix, but a big operator in infinite dimensions. Okay, so the way to solve it, one will be to use subsampling. And in fact, with this, uh, we kill like essentially three birds in one stone. Yep. Yeah? A question in, with the two problems, I don't understand the first one. Can you say again why is that the problem? Oh, why? Because now I still have to deal with inequality, which is for all x in a, in the big space. So I have. I still have to uh, deal with a continuous set of inequalities. Uh, of equalities, 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 equalities. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So I, I don't know how to, uh, what I was doing before was to represent H as a quadratic form. But this, in the infinite dimensions, I don't know how to do it. Okay? Okay. okay? So I'm going to use subsampling, and I will kill like three birds in one stone that will make the problem. Uh, uh, solvable and that will allow only to access H through function values. Okay, so I'm going to replace this. 
No, 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 no. You, you could, you could as well, if you have access, so I, I may do it a bit tomorrow, if you access H through other oracles, maybe like Fourier series, Fourier transform, then you will use random features. Yeah. You need to access H in some ways, okay? And we are, here we assume that H is accessible by function values. You replace it by H of Xi equal to C plus phi. Let me, what is it? H of Xi equal to C plus phi of Xi. Okay, this infinite dimensions, okay? A phi of Xi. Okay, so sorry, I'm in two dimensions. All right, for all i in 1 to n. All right. So, uh, just a question yeah. to sum up what yeah. we did just before. Yeah. So, the previous assumption was that if the function is cn, it's yeah. a unique minimizer yeah. and so on and so forth, then it is a sum of squares yep. with some uh, restrictions. Yeah. So, now we do. So now this means that from the bottom right here, that that problem, there is an A star which satisfies the constraints. This PSD, this PSD here, it is PSD, and the C that we have is the infimum of H, the infimum of H. So the, the solution of that problem is the minimum of H on, the, on omega. But how did we, uh, so do we have this representation, right? Yeah. So the, the, the way, so if you write this as sum over i of h i x square, okay, then you have to represent each of the h i's as some, let's call it h uh, g i dot product phi of x. Okay, so this is possible because h i is sufficiently differentiable and then is included in my KHS. And then, what is A here? A becomes sum over I of GI tensor product GI. Okay, maybe I was a bit too quick here. That's fine. Okay, so this is the... Yes, yeah, so you build... Yeah, as I showed yesterday, your, if you're a sum of squares, A can be decomposed that way, with G being the eigenvectors. Okay, so here we do the opposite. We start from the components and we build A. Any other questions? All right, so now I'm going to use subsampling. So I'm going to take xi uniformly at random in omega. Another reason to take omega compact, OK, and simple, because you can, can take xi. It could be a random, quasi-random, whatever you want. It has to spread the space. All right, so uh, now the question is, uh, uh, I'm losing something. Okay, so now what I have, so if I plot, let's say here, I plot h, so here this is x, and here this is h of x minus c minus phi of x, a phi of x. Actually, I am zero at some point. Okay, this is x1. This is x2, this is x3, etc. And what I have is the function that is oscillating like this. Okay, I know it is zero at those points because I added the constraint, but I need to control the oscillations of the functions around zero. And for that, I'm going to need to constrain the norm of A, very much like in supervised learning or non-parametric statistics. I need to add a penalty on A, and the penalty I will add, I will penalize essentially the trace of A. Okay, that could be any spectral function, doesn't matter. Okay, it could be the, Frobe, the Hilbert Schmidt norm, Frobenius norm, could be the spectral norm, could be whatever you want. We do the trace of A uh, for reasons I will not explain. But, um, and now, once you do that, we can rely on like 50 years of non-parametric statistics. Okay, we have function for which we know it is so the thing equal for a subset, what is the width of those oscillations, okay? This we can characterize by, by reusing existing results. And the width of those oscillations, if you look carefully, 
will be uh, will be the sub optimality factor in my problem okay? because I'm going to essentially have c up to epsilon so I, am, I end up with uh, here an epsilon uh, error okay so here what I get is that uh, results from uniform approximations okay so I have a function which is zero at some points how big can it be translate into uh, results for uh, optimization okay and so here that width epsilon okay so we know exactly uh, how to characterize it so this is i won't do the, the math but this is known from statistics for from quite a while and what you can show is that so what we get uh, so the proposition that we have with uh, with uh, Alessandro and uh, Luis is that uh, to reach error epsilon, okay, in high probability, okay, so here high probability over what? Over the random sample, okay. Then you need n being essentially of the order by bigger than epsilon to the minus d over m minus 3. Correct? Yes, and you need also for m bigger than s plus 3. Okay? So s here the order of the subolet space. No, it's n and m. So this is n, number of samples, and m. m. So there's one more, uh, one more leg in this one. What? M, m is m is the uh, uh, differentiability of h. Oh yeah, yeah. Dt of h. Okay, let's forget about that at the moment. So what what we say is that. Uh, if you want to reach epsilon in optimizing uh, H, okay, provably, then you need to select a number of Xi's which will grow with epsilon, okay? And what we cover here, we cover something which is, which is, uh, which is uh, close to the lower bound, okay? So, note, I mean, note lower bound, With uh, with no with uh, exponential computations, but potentially exponential computations is epsilon minus d over m. Okay, so what, what so this is a so what you can show is that if you want to optimize functions which are m times differentiable, okay, through only accessing oracles uh, function values, the best you can do to achieve precision epsilon is to query at least n being of that form. Okay, so what do I cover? That if m is 1, at the Lipschitz continuity, then I need, if m is 1, an exponential number of query points per dimension. Okay, so this is normal. Okay, we do the global optimization with no complexity assumption. In dimension d, you have to pay a price, and the price is strong price. But as soon as you have some smoothness, okay, you can have this, uh, have this uh, smaller. Okay? In particular, if m gets bigger and bigger, the d over m will be smaller and smaller. And what I forgot to mention is that here, there is a, a constant there, which is exponential typically in d. Okay? So here, uh, uh, so this is like the, this is a, what is known is that the in terms of precision, the, pre the, the exponent is a precision parameter will not, will not pay the curse of dimensionality if uh, you optimize smooth functions. Okay? So if you want to optimize something which is very irregular, there is no way you can do it, uh, at least in the worst case, okay? if you want something that works for all functions of a given regularity. And what we can achieve is something which is close. So we have this. So this is one limitation. And due to the fact that in the sum of squares representation we lose one order, this one I don't know how to, how to remove, I wouldn't know at the moment, 
and we have this limitation, we need to always have very smooth functions. Okay, but this is easy because this is a, this is a classical problem with kernel methods. So with kernel methods, you model your problem with very smooth functions. Okay, it does not mean you have to apply it only to smooth functions. Okay, you can be misspecified and have functions which are outside of the model class. This simply means that you have to regularize in a, in a, in a correct way. Okay, and this we can achieve it. And this is in the paper, so you can remove this, so you remo remove that, and you're fine. Okay, but the key limitation is, uh, is this. But what we gain compared to the lower bound, the lower bound does not say anything about computations. Okay, so here what we have, we are simply solving now, uh, uh, let, we are solving an SDP. Yes, good transition. Okay, and what I will do, uh, what I will do uh, uh, tomorrow is to show that you can go to finite dimensions, and there will be one one word, representer theorem. So why? Now what we have is let me write down and stop, write down the uh, write down the optimization problem, which is. And then I stop. So you write down. You write down so the sup over C and C and A PSD such that okay this is okay and indeed you do have uh, eight infinite dimensions oh aha minus lambda trace of A this is a key part so we penalize a, a trace of A so now what we have we have a problem we op we, op we optimize A which is accessed only through dot products with phi of xi times phi of xi, and we penalize some spectral function. Okay, so this looks like I had minus f square and I had f phi of xi. Okay, this looks a lot like that. Okay, you access through function values like dot products of f and you penalize the square norm. So here we have something with operators plus the PSD constraint. And what we had shown earlier with Ulysse and Ale is that in that situation, you can show that A is of the form sum of ij from 1 to n of phi of xi transpose uh, tensor product phi of xj times cij, with c is psd. But now c is in rn. Okay, so it's equivalent of the representer theorem that, that I showed earlier for like linear forms extend to quadratic forms and you get like this representation and now you are in the finite dimensions dimension n and you can run it okay. yeah so to summarize what we have seen today okay so we started from the problem with all x we subsampled I did, regu I did regularization and this solves like several problems. First, you can run the algorithm because of this, which I will explain more uh, 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 tomorrow. You access H only through function values, which was our oracle we wanted uh, to have originally. And there was a third thing which I uh, forgot, but uh, yeah. So tomorrow, what I will do tomorrow, I will so finish this and recap what we have seen and look at three extensions. Okay, so. So for the moment, I focused only on optimization, but sum of squares has been applied to many problems. Optimal control, reverse mode learning. I will sh explain how you go to other problems. Okay, optimal control. And also, I will go over a, a situation where you want, you want to replace the max by uh, free energy or whatever you want to call it. I call it log sum x, okay? And that will uh, that you will need to we will still consider now we'll go to the to the k view we're going to consider the integral of mu x phi of x phi of x transpose and play around with a quantum entropies to get uh, to define some equivalent of log sum x so this will be for tomorrow and on this thank you for your attention and see you tomorrow.